Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me. My name is Wishoyo Alvitre, and I am a comic book penciler and inker. And um, my most recent work you'll be able to see this week on Marvel Indigenous Voices, number one. Um, so today I'm going to be doing two sketches, and I'm going to start out with doing like an echo sketch. Um, get my camera to focus just a bit here. All right, I think it's focused now. So um, I really like, uh, well, I guess I will go over some of my supplies. I have a Koh-i-Noor Hardsmooth um, mechanical pencil. These are the mechanical pencils that I generally use. Um, I really like the grip on them, and they're lightweight. They're pretty durable. So this is what I've been using over the years. Um, and my pencils are very... Um, rough. So I'm not going to go into very detailed pencils for this. You'll see some just, you know, real loose figurative stuff just to get the action down. Um, and then because I ink my own work, I, I have a tendency to just save a lot of the detail and stuff for the inking stage. And I've inked my own work for quite a bit of time, so I oftentimes don't um, do my pencils for somebody to ink my own stuff. I'm just more comfortable with it. Um, so I'm starting off here at the top, just doing kind of like a shape to get the proportions right for her head. Um, I want to give her like a strong jawline, kind of an upward gaze, so I'm going to put in some just real basic lines on where I think the eyes should be placed. I'm going to be using her new hairstyle um, that David Mack kind of reintroduced, um, I think partially for this, this series launch. So she used to have her hair up in sort of like a messy ballerina bun with some feathers in it, and um, David did this really kind of cool, a um, little bit more modern, like four braid thing. And I was actually looking up um, old historical photos of some native people and um, found a couple of photos where they had sort of the four braids implemented in their hairstyle, which I thought was pretty cool. So I, I really wanted to use sort of the, the new um, design that he had. And I like that her, her style kind of changes as her character evolves in the Marvel Universe. So um, this was originally a little bit more of a vertical uh, layout, and so I'm just kind of readjusting it for a horizontal format for you guys. And there's her nose, bridge line. Her handprint will roughly go right about here. I have a tendency usually to start with the eyes to try to get the the personality of the character coming through first before I start solidifying anything else in the drawing. And I'm giving her kind of a, I can do this on my own, I don't need any help kind of attitude, um, which I think the character kind of just has innately. She doesn't re need the help from anybody else, and that's one of the things I really liked about her character when she was introduced. She's very capable of learning new skills on her own and replicating skills of whoever she's fighting or something that she's trying to learn, which I, I find really intriguing. So I, I love Echo. Um, I was a huge fan of the character prior to um, being able to work with um, Marvel on the actual pages for her. And... Um, one of my very first portfolio reviews when I was like, I think before 20, I went to San Diego Comic-Con and I had done some Echo sample pages after the initial run from David Mack. Um, so what I did is I took kind of the, the storyline that had been left off and kind of rewrote it on my own terms and I did like four to five sample pages. Um, 
that I in turn tried to mimic the style of David Mack. Um, so I, I did them in watercolor painting, kind of mixed media, pen and ink style. And I went to San Diego Comic Con and, you know, David Mack was at his booth and he was so kind at the time. And he went and he did a small portfolio review looking at the pages. And we talked about a lot of stuff because I was a big fan of his work prior to him creating the character with his work on um, Scarab and Kabuki. But one of the things that really stood out with um, the character at the time was there was no Native American comic book characters like available for me to read about, really, and let alone a female character. So when she came out, I was just astounded that, oh, man, this is like one of the, the rare few um, female Native American characters in the comic book universe that I'm familiar with. Um, and so it really stood out to me as a very powerful uh, you know, representation that I didn't have growing up. Because when I started reading these books, you know, I was almost in college. And I was always a big fan of characters like Psylocke. Um, and some of the more like just obscure characters that had psychic abilities and stuff in the the universe, and so I really liked kind of the the parallels of her costume. I thought it looked a little bit like Psylocke's costume, which was pretty cool. She was a character I always liked drawing when I was young. So you can see I'm kind of just changing small things, like her eyelid looked a little bit too big there. So I'm going back in and kind of readjusting her eyebrow too to give her a little bit more attitude. So I do a lot of this kind of like molding and shaping prior to doing ink work, just so I have everything there that I want in place before I start laying down ink lines. Another thing I really loved about the character, too, is when um, Joe Quesada drew her. He had such a angular, blocky style in the way that he drew her facial features. So she wasn't necessarily your typical standard beauty. You could really see that she, you know, was an ethnic character um, and drawn so with, you know, an understanding that certain facial features are just shaped differently. So I really, I really just love that about his work. And the fluidity that he was allowed to just show with not only her costume, but like in the fight scenes. I mean, some of those fight scene pages are just probably my favorite pages out of anything that I've ever read. They're, they're so simple in some of the shots, but they're so well executed. So here I'm going to introduce sort of the, the flow for her hair. She's got four braids, so there's like two braids on either side. I'm going to have one kind of coming over her shoulder here. And then in her new costume, she has sort of this, um, it's almost like a sports uh, tank top or dance wear. So it's cut back very much like a sports bra. I'm just kind of going to draw that in. And I'm going to give her a very graceful kind of dancing or hand movement, arm movement. And it looks like I have some questions coming in too, so let me get to those real quick. I have a question from YouTube. Do you ever start on paper then switch to digital for final touches? Um, I I don't like to use digital very much. Um, I, I kind of fight it in a lot of the work that I do. I really prefer traditional media. I like the way that it lays down on paper. I like having to live with your mistakes, so to speak. Um, and I only generally use digital programs or digital touch-ups if the job requires it. Um, sometimes the clients that I work for, they, they prefer a digital final piece of art. So um, I have to take that into consideration how I'm going to approach whatever it is that I'm drawing. Um, but if I can get away with doing 100% traditional, I will. <laughs> and I've always been that way. And you know, so far, Photoshop and Procreate and all these other programs, they haven't quite changed it. Like I, I actually get really bad eye strain working on the computer, um, which is another thing I don't like to deal with. 
So working with traditional media, not staring at a screen for hours on end, it, it does help with eye strain and preventing eye strain for me. And that's something that I've just kind of recently found out after doing some pro or projects that have required me to, you know, do most of the art and most of the finishes digitally. I have a question from Twitch and it says from Dumb Gus, how do you recommend to practice drawing on your own without teaching? Um, one thing that I, I had an art teacher in high school and from the very first day in class, the first thing that she told us is get a sketchbook and maintain a sketchbook. And she, you know, she just pushed this throughout all the years that I had her. And honestly, I think that's some of the very best advice. Not only does it allow you to get ideas out of your head, but it allows you to play with artwork where you're not actually having to draw things um, for a project or a job. You can get really kind of cerebral ideas out of your head into a sketchbook. And they don't necessarily have to be finished drawings. They can just be like a, an idea of something that maybe crossed your mind. And I think it allows you to just play with your thoughts a lot. Um, and a lot of the time, those things can manifest into some really cool pieces of art too. But it helps you to maintain um, constant drawing day to day. So if you do a page a day in a sketchbook, you're you're constantly going to have something in production, thoughts in production, um, and maybe some of those things in a sketchbook will translate into bigger projects too. But I would say that's probably the best advice I could give is to keep a sketchbook. And if you can draw from life too, like say you have a day and you just do not know what to draw, um, go outside somewhere and draw buildings, draw plant life, draw animals, um, even five, 10 minutes a day. That's all you need to do. Just as long as you're making lines on a piece of paper once a day, it helps your brain and it helps you to learn and grow as an artist. Yeah, I have some questions about Echo. Echo, she is a um, deaf um, Native American character. So uh, she was introduced, I believe in, goodness, I think 2008 through uh, a Daredevil um, issues. So she was a, a character in that universe. And um, she can mimic people's motions and movements because of her handicap, not being able to hear things very much like daredevil's blindness she's utilized her handicap in a way that allows her to quickly learn through um, visual observation and also through the ability to feel vibrations so she can't actually hear those vibrations but she can feel them in her body and um, in some of the original issues they do flashbacks to where she's a kid and she's watching somebody play piano and she puts her hands on the piano and she can actually feel the vibrations and that allows her a whole different way to learn um, skills at a very young age. And I just thought the way that they handled, you know, her handicaps and treating them in a way of not something that would hinder her learning or her creativity, really something beautiful. Um, and it's a very subtle uh, thing that goes throughout the, the story arc, but it's really well done. So she is being brought back in this storyline through Marvel's Indigenous Voices. Um, and the, the current story that comes out, I think it's the 18th, um, by Rebecca Roanhorse. And I did the art for it, the 10-page story short. And I'm really super excited to see her character um, be given some more potential in the Marvel Universe. So she has sort of, um, it's almost like athletic tape, like when you injure yourself or the way that boxers sort of wrap their hands when they're fighting, um, wrapped around her arms. And that was part of her initial costume. Her, her costume was very kind of like DIY um, from the first pages. And uh, I, I, I love kind of the unevenness of... You can't ever control how tape is going to be wrapped around your hands. It's not nice, perfect straight lines. So I always draw them kind of just haphazardly and not 
completely lined up, the little spaces here and there in between. She's got much more of like technical athletic wear in her current costume that we kind of played with for the, the new issue. And she was also, um, I think the Ronin character, she was written in in a different storyline too. So um, she's got kind of like a, almost like a Japanese kind of themed waistband thing in her current costume. So I'm going to read you this bottom piece here. And then I think I'll be ready for inks. Um, the original one, I kind of had her holding some um, kind of like ribbon sticks. I was going to play with the idea of ribbons, um, kind of like dancers have. But I had to adjust the perspective on this, so I'm going to have to do it just a bit differently. So as you can see, my scribbles here are actually me kind of adjusting her her angle of her hand on what she would be holding from the wrist down. So I'm trying to figure out if I want to do it either sort of a straight along the back of the hand here or a different perspective. Um, I think I'm going to do a foreshortened kind of stick. And I wanted to kind of play with her name because I, I love just the simplicity of the word echo. And I think from a design standpoint, um, I kind of played, you'll see in the pages, with kind of like branding echo and ways to write echo and the way that it, um, the letters can be turned into almost like echo location waves. And then I'm using this sort of H to kind of mimic the flow of her hair coming down here. And I always liked that she was kind of like, her hair was never perfectly in place. I mean, when you're a dancer and you're doing martial arts, your hair gets thrown around. So I think I just always appreciated the real realness that they incorporated into our original character design with the messy, you know, ballerina bun. Um, but also just with the braids now, I think it's kind of a cool redesign. And it makes sense too. I mean, I have long hair. And if I were to be doing anything close to what she does, my hair would totally get in the way. So braids keep it out of the way. Um, I think they also help to really kind of like translate some of her movements when she's, you know, in fight scenes and stuff. You can use the braids to sort of go with the, the flows of whatever movement that her body's in too. So um, I'm going to start on inks on this. I think there's enough here that I can um, begin the inking process. And what I'm using just for ease on this um, video is some Pentel brush pens, the pocket brush. I know these are really popular along a lot of the artists that do live stream and stuff. Um, but they're, they're nice and easy on my wrist. Um, I find that when I use microns, the microns oftentimes make me push harder into a piece of paper. Whereas these, you really kind of have to be light-handed. Um, so it, it takes a little pressure off my wrist. You can get quite a bit of variation with these two, which is really nice. I mean, very much like a, a brush would. If you're very light-handed, um, you can get some really nice fine lines, and you can also get some really bold strokes too with them. And I think I have a couple more questions. Let me check that real quick.
OK, I have a question from Twitch from Futures I Beats. Uh, I am First Nation, so it's always cool to see Native American characters in the Marvel Universe. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really excited that, you know, Marvel sought out not only creative Native talent for this as far as artists, but also they sought out um, Indigenous storytellers, writers, um, who not only have experience writing comics, but they also are novelists, short story writers. You know, they're very well seasoned in the work that they do. Um, so they really made an effort all around to make sure we're being represented um, in the best way possible with this project, which I appreciate. I have another question on Twitch from Devil's Reapers. Who is your favorite character? <laughs> um, probably Echo. Honestly, when they first approached me with this project, um, they gave me a couple other characters that would be potential characters that I could you know, choose from for the storyline. And I didn't see Echo's name in that list. And I didn't know either you know, how many characters were going to be reintroduced through this. Um, if somebody had already taken Echo, what other artists and writers they had even asked to participate. So it was very kind of, I was in the dark. And my very first email back, I think, to the editor was like, hey, is Danny Moonstar or Echo like available at all for this project? Because I would love to do, first of all, an indigenous female, because doing female characters, I think, is really important as far as representation goes. There's a lot more male characters in the universe than there are female characters. So I have a tendency to prefer to work on female characters because I'm, I'm female and I feel like I can relate to them on that level. Um, but Echo, just because she was introduced when I was an avid comic book reader um, and me kind of following her progression as a character too, I felt kind of really tied to her. And I was really excited when they said, yeah, she's actually available. Um, so yeah, I would say she's probably one of my number one characters. On YouTube, um, somebody's asking, does it feel better to draw with pencils than pens? Uh, it kind of depends. I, I like doing pencil art. I like doing inks. It's, it's a different process. Inks, you really have to think about um, line weights and making nice, clean shapes. When you're working with pencils, you can render things in gray tones. You can get really, really detailed, or you can just keep things very loose. I'm a big fan of other artists' sketchbooks um, for the sole reason, because you have their pencil sketches in there. I think that's a really beautiful line weight. And that's a lot of the time stuff that like inspires me, other people's pencil work. And not necessarily clean, finished pencils. I'm, I'm honestly much more interested and intrigued and inspired by loose pencil sketches or half ideas or unfinished pages and stuff. One thing I have to be careful with is that I don't lay my hand over where I'm drawing and smear this. Because <laughs> it's a little cold today, and we just had rain a few days ago, so I'm noticing that my, my inks are not drying as quickly as they would if the weather was a little bit warmer. So that's always a fun thing. Especially when you have deadlines and you need to ink pages and you can't erase your pencils and stuff off them because of the humidities. No, not helping you. So I don't know if I'll be able to erase the pencils once I finish the inks on this, but um I will probably by the end of today, and then I'll post these on my Instagram page as well. So you can kind of get a better idea of what the finished inks look like.
It looks like I have more questions too. Um, you guys are great with the questions. Thank you, because this helps me. Um, on YouTube, let's see. Who are your biggest influences for style? Mm, that's a good question. I, growing up, was a huge fan of Michael Turner. Um, he used to do a lot of, um, you know, Witchblade and Fathom. And I think part of it was that he really had an appreciation for the environments that he drew. He was a surfer and he loved the water. And so you really got to see that and him playing and having fun with these worlds that he created in Fathom. Um, but his line style was just tremendous. Like I didn't know anybody doing line work like he was doing at the time. Um, and it's sad that he's not with us currently, but he was one of the major influences when I first started reading comic books. Um, Bill Sankovich has always been a huge inspiration too. I was introduced to his work um, by my boyfriend in high school, who's now my husband, and he gave me a Electra Assassin graphic novel. And I think that kind of sealed it as, you know, this is also comic book art, and this is also just crazy, like, really kind of abstract art and usage of materials. And to this day, he's probably one of my favorite artists, just because you never, you can never anticipate the way he's going to, um, do something he has such a he can do complete photorealism and he can do um almost cartoony uh real kind of abstraction and his usage of materials if you've ever seen him draw live is just tremendous he has so much energy and love for what he does so he's a big influence david mack of course is a huge influence and partially for the same reasons um seeing that somebody with you know profound watercolor skills could be doing sequential art was really amazing for art styles uh eric canetti i really enjoy his ink work and his line work and his energy so i kind of have a tendency i think artists that can show a lot of movement and energy um either in their panel work or their their pinups and then also traditional mixed media Eric Kennedy does a lot of marker rendering. David Mack uses paint. Bill uses anything he can get his hands on, I think. Um, so just playing with different materials and not being um, stuck to just pen and ink or just digital colors or something like that is really interesting to me and inspiring. I like to see people play with materials. How do you keep your hand from getting tired? This is a question on YouTube. Do you limit how many hours per day you draw? I sit. <laughs> That's a good question. I actually, I have um, tendonitis in my right drawing hand and it stems from like a car accident I got involved in. Um, when I was in college, I had a hit and run. They hit me on the driver's side. And so I have a pinched nerve in my neck, which in turn has kind of, um, complicated the tendonitis in my hand, but I find that not using microns helps. Um, using brush pens or brushes or a, a quill actually takes the pressure off my hand um, a lot of the time. With microns, for some reason, I have a tendency to just grind it into the paper. I don't know why. Um, and for a long time, I was just using exclusively microns, and I had much more pain um, with technical pens than I do with brushwork. So um, I'm also, I try to stretch fairly often when I start feeling pain. Um, I used to work through it, and honestly, that's terrible advice. Don't ever work through the pain if you're feeling uncomfortable when you're drawing. Take a break, stretch it out, um, and you know, hope that that helps it. If it doesn't help, then maybe you need to do like some acupressure points or um, take a break, go for a walk, something like that which is hard to say when you're on a deadline and stuff. Um, but listening to your body is key to doing this job because for, you know, most of the time you're spending very long hours in your chair in a very stationary position. Your hand is in a very stationary way um, that you're manipulating it. And if you have injuries, they can flare up quite quickly and get aggravated quite quickly from that.
So I usually don't draw until it hurts so bad that I need to ice it. But when I do have flare-ups with my, my tendonitis, I, I usually um, do Epsom salt soaks, which really help. And Tiger Balm is my best friend. It works better than CBD. So. <laughs> I have a question on Facebook. How do you go about illustrating sign language in comic panels? I actually took a sign language class in college, and um, I actually have trouble with language classes for some reason. And that class I managed to pass. <laughs> I'm really good in other like class things. I'm normally a straight A student, but languages for some reason have always been incredibly difficult, and you know, high end mathematics too for me. But um, so I had a you know, I have familiarity with sign language enough to where I know basic patterning. And I know with the script that we had, um, before I was even handed the script over, I, I was reading comments on Twitter and stuff and how important it is to show sign language through this comic. So I was, I was really hoping that the writer, you know, kind of use that in some way in the script, even though it was only 10 pages of, you know, work, we did manage to incorporate a scene um, with the character, and she she's doing sign language. So what I had to do, so many motions and words in sign language are um, their movements. So they're not stationary hand formations. They're usually a hand formation, and then it moves and creates that word in the space in front of you. And so um, the the term that we were using, she was saying, I'm looking for you or looking for you. And there was a sign gesture that that explained that in sign language. And so the challenge was for me to boil it down into a single panel. Like, how can I show that she's speaking sign language to this character? And what I did is I, I referenced kind of the way David Mack kind of played with that, where he would either spell it out in little letters across the, the panel. And then also sometimes he would encapsulate individual signs, so like letters, like um, and put those as part of the art. So I had a really good foundation, I just the way that David Max handled it with the character throughout issues. But I'm, I'm really glad that he was able to do that. And to, it just goes to show that, you know, with his art style, I don't think very many people would have been able to translate sign language into the, the panel to panel style so easily. And, you know, he's kind of the perfect person to use his art style, um, mimicking the work that he had done in Kabuki and Scarab, but translating it to a character that was deaf. I have a question from Jay on Facebook. Thank you for speaking to our class. See some the other day. I was so inspired. Thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to listen to that. On my off time, I, I actually do some lectures at universities and museums um, involving comics a lot of the time, and then also involving some of the historical work that I do on the side. Some of my other projects have involved um, historical sort of rewriting and reframing historical events through indigenous lenses in comic book format. So I'm a big history buff. I have a question on Twitch from Captain Cruz. Um, for the comic book process, is it written, then drawn, then ink, then lettering? What's the order? Um, from the way that I mainly work within comics, usually I'm given either a layout to a script or a script. So the writing generally comes first. Uh, I read through that. I do thumbnails, and those thumbnails then get turned into rough pencils, um, and then those go through an approval process. And when I have the OK on those, I do um, you know, the finished pencils on 11 by 17 paper. And then after I'm done with the pencils, I scan, send for approval. And when I have approval on those, then I can jump into inks and finishes. I know some other artists work slightly differently based on the technology. Sometimes they will either light box their thumbnails um, or they will scan them into a computer digitally and print on large paper so they can skip that step. 
and I kind of have a preference to not do that. Um, I kind of like all the process that goes involving, um, you know, traditional thumbnails, forcing your brain to be able to enlarge those. And it's good practice too. Just kind of keeps your skills sharp. So I think I've got about five more minutes on finishing this one up. And I'm going to start on the second piece pretty soon. I like to add a little bit of texture when I'm doing kind of the bands wrapped around her arm. And I know that the material's pretty thin. So some people, when they draw it, they'll just literally kind of trace the shape of her arm as if it had nothing on it. But I think by, you know, giving it just a little bit of a texture on the outside of the line, it kind of just emphasizes that, you know, this is a part of a costume and has weight and mass and everything else. I have a question on or comment on YouTube. I am Hudanas Sony, Sony Mohawk, and I've followed your work on Instagram for some time. Yahwen for being an inspiration. Thank you so much for following my stuff. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm I'm at Washoyo on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. So if anybody doesn't follow me and they would like to, feel free. And to those of you who are, you know, found out about this because they follow my work or followed my work over the years, I really appreciate the support. From Twitch, Future, I Beats, when did, or what do you do when you have writers drawing, writers or drawing block? Uh, you work on through it. <laughs> you make yourself draw anyway. Um, when you do this professionally, you don't often get the luxury of having an off day. Um, most of the time you have deadlines and you have to get work done. I mean, I, I generally work five to seven days a week. Um, on things and I don't have to work straight, you know, eight hour shifts or whatever, like I would at a normal job, but I have to put the time in and I don't often have the luxury of having a day where I don't do art. Um, and if I do have a day off from, you know, deadlines and work that I'm getting hired to do, then it's my, my free time involves me doing artwork for myself. So <laughs> I, I never kind of step out of it. It's, it's the life that I live. I love doing art. Um, and I have a lot of stories that I'd like to tell on my own. So if I ever do get a day off, I try to devote as much time to those that I, I can. I, I write as well. So um, eventually I'd like to be writing and drawing um, my own work. And I have done a little bit of that. Somebody from YouTube looks epic. How long have you been doing this? Thank you very much. Um, I've been doing comics since I was in my last years of high school. Um, I was working independently in college as an inker on some independent books and then doing pinups here and there. Eventually, um, I apprenticed many years with Howard Chaikin, um, whom I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And he is a swell guy. I've learned so much from him. And then in my later years in college, I was doing um, pencils and inks for lots of independent books and then um, some more mainstream stuff. I, I've done pinups for Umbrella Academy. I think it was issue six, the very first run that they did with the James Jean covers. Um, I was invited to do a an image of Space Boy for that. Um, I've worked on lots of anthologies. I've worked on art direction for some video games. Um, there's a video game called When Rivers Were Trails that was independently um, financed, and uh, it's an in indigenous-oriented video game, and I was art director on that. So I've been I've been doing comics 
for the better part of the last 15, 20 years. So right now I'm just wrapping up sort of the, the black bandages that would go up her arm. And they kind of open up at the very top here. And hopefully I don't run out of ink. The one thing about these um, brush pens is I seem to burn through the little ink cartridges. I have like three of them lined up just in case that happens. <laughs> I'm prepared. From Twitch, Mr. Pennyworth, or Pennyworth, is your desk flat or tilted? Um, for this particular live stream, I'm actually kind of, I had to set up in another room. So this isn't where I normally work or how I normally work. This is a little bit different. This is literally for filming purposes only. Um, normally, I have a flat desk and I have like a, either I use one of these pieces of oversized illustration board sort of as a drawing board. So I tilt that up onto my flat desk and I work at an angle generally. Occasionally I'll work flat. I mean, if I'm working with paints and wet material, then sometimes you can't work at an angle too much. From Twitch for our leaf, how long have you been working for Marvel? Uh, when I interned with Howard Chaikin, we were on several different Marvel projects, um, but I was working as an office intern, so my name wasn't on those things. Um, so this is kind of like my first project as an independent artist for Marvel where I can put my name on it and say I penciled and inked, you know, this. On YouTube, do you remember or do you recommend drawing without it? A reference. I can draw with reference pretty good, but it looks like a five-year-old drew it without reference. Uh, I, I recommend referencing. I use reference for most of the work that I do. I've taken many years of life drawing class. Um, I will draw when I'm watching TV or watching movies and stuff and just capture certain things that are interesting to me. Um, if I'm ever doing, you know, like my comic book work, I have a huge... Um, library that I've kind of built over the years. So I have art reference material, and then I create reference folders on my computer for each job that I do. So if there's anything that I'm questioning how to draw or, you know, just need that extra reference, I definitely will seek it out. Because I, I honestly think if you can learn to draw it from a reference photo, it kind of creates like a, a mental library, a mental encyclopedia. So any future jobs after that, you can be like, oh, well, I drew it for that last job. I know how to draw this now. And it just really strengthens, you know, your your art overall. And some people are asking where to find me on social media. I can actually be found if you just search my first name. It's spelled W-E-S-H-O-Y-O-T. Um, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. And I'm, I also have my own website, wishoyo.com. I'm going to rotate this just real quick to do the sideline of her face so I don't smear anything. I really tried with these marble pages to kind of give her kind of like a bold outline. Um, I find some of the shapes, you know, use just the angular facial shapes and everything else really interesting with the character. And so I kind of went a little bit bolder than I normally do.
And I think I'm almost done here. I'm just going to quickly kind of ink this ribbon design that I threw on here. I might go in at a later time too and just kind of add some gray tones to this because I think it would be cool. Maybe even ink wash. I'm using new paper on this that I thought I would try out. Um, I use a lot of Canson illustration board because it's heavier than Bristol, especially for cover work that I do. Um, and when I do mixed media, um, it just holds up a little bit better than strict comic board. And these are actually Canson, it's like thick illustration board, but cut down to size. I'm going to overlay this real quick just so I don't smear it. Um, this is a, just a nice trick in case if you have a habit of getting ink on the side of your hand here, just lay paper over it and then you can go and sort of, you know, do what you need to do and you don't have to worry about destroying what you just did. These brush pens kind of have a tendency, if you go too quickly, they want to kind of create a dry brush look on the edge. And sometimes that's great, but it's not really what I wanted on here. So it's a little bit of that combined with um, this paper, because it has a little bit of a texture to it. It's not perfectly smooth. It's not like a vellum. Let me pull another question off the boards here. I have a question from YouTube from Antone. Um, if you were a superhero, what is your favorite superpower? <laughs> you know, I, I actually got asked this on a a panel. I can't even remember what the panel was for. I think it was like for archaeological stuff or historical stuff that I was talking about. And I always thought it would be a cool superpower. I mean, you have so much stuff in museum archives and um, kind of like that scene in Black Panther. Um, but wouldn't it be incredible to be able to talk to the people either that created, you know, pieces in museums or maybe their, like, ghosts are still in those pieces? Um, so I think my superpower would be something like that, like a psychic ability to be able to communicate with the dead or figure out where all these things in museums go, repatriate them. <laughs> so at this point, I'm just, I'm really kind of playing with the shapes. It's supposed to sort of look like it was done in ribbon. Just behind her is kind of a fun little element. I think I'm going to bring the O oh, actually higher up. So I have, I always do that too. That's one nice thing about when you um, pencil and ink your own stuff. If you make a choice, it's not always stuck in stone. If you have somebody else inking your material, you kind of have to make those decisions a little bit earlier on and live with them. 
every once in a while I'll kind of switch things around where I don't feel like maybe that's the best placement anymore as I go along inking. And that's fine. I think it's important to be able to work with mistakes or work with changes. I mean, it's it's so hard to make all these choices and figure things out before you've actually gotten into the inks or whatever for project. So. So there we go, that's that one. I'm gonna move on to a second illustration. So there you guys can see it, kind of cool. And like I said, I'll probably, um, I'll clean this up later and do maybe a, an ink wash or a gray tone wash on this. So the second piece, I'm going to be drawing a character that's um, part of the Indigenous Voices collection and um, get a little stretch on here too, too. It's important to stretch at least once an hour if you're doing this a lot. <laughs> so um, there's a variant cover by Jeffrey Varegi, um, who's done a whole series of variant covers for this Indigenous Voices one. And I think one of my favorite ones that he did is of a character called Kushala. And she's actually a character I'm not super familiar with, but I love her character design. Um, there's a little glue on this. So here's the reference material that I'm using, which is a character design from her run in Doctor Strange. And the ink work here is just beautiful. I unfortunately don't have the name of the artist who did that work, but that's what I'll be using. Let's see if there's any more questions coming through as well while I start penciling this. From Twitch, uh, for our leaf, I'm loving this pen. Where do you get your art supplies from? Uh, I, I try to, if I have an independent art store located in my town, I try to buy from them as much as possible because um, I think it's so important to support your, your local businesses. However, Right now, we do not have any local art stores um, within close driving distances. So I oftentimes order from like Dick Blick catalog. Um, most of the tools that I get are pretty easy to find online. I'm not sure about the pencils. I haven't, these are really old pencils. I've had them for probably almost 10 years. Um, I'm sure they probably still make them though. The only art supplies that I have that, um, you can't order from an art supply catalog. I, I collect antique pens. So I have a collection of like turn of the century, early 1900 um, quill dip pens and um, also some from the 1800s. And those are my favorite things, but they're really hard to find in good condition. So it becomes kind of like a, a constant search. I have like some searches saved and stuff. Um, And I thought about using those on this stream, but I, because I'm not set up in my normal studio space, I also didn't want to spill ink live on the air because that'd be pretty messy. So yeah, these pocket pens, they're, they're by Pentel. They're really easy to find. You can find them at most, you know, art supply stores. They, um, they have a synthetic tip on there and they actually just, you unscrew this piece and it has a changeable um, sort of a little cartridge. So when it ro runs out of ink, you don't have to fill it up in any sort of fancy way. You just pop the old cartridge out and recycle it and then um, pop a new one in. Most of the time, my kids are running around me when I'm doing art, so they're pretty childproof. You're not going to have spilt ink anywhere or anything terrible. So with this piece, I'm just, I have a sketch that I'm working off of that I did, and um, I'm just working off that and kind of readjusting it for a horizontal format. But like I said, I, I love her character design. It's kind of Mad Max, like Road Warrior, 
meets kind of like motorcycle culture, meets like traditional, you know, Apache wear. And I might try to sneak in some colors on this piece. I'm not sure if I'll have time or not, but I would like to just add some because she's got such great coloring in her costume. From Twitch, um, SFG Ruf Rufio. <laughs> Uh, do you have books or media you recommend on learning techniques on line work and inking? Uh, I don't, I'm not one to watch uh, other people like live stream very much. A lot of the ink techniques that I use, I've learned from books. Um, a lot of my favorite, you know, inkers and people, line weights that I really love are from turn of the century illustrations. So like newspaper illustrations by Windsor McKay or very early 18, 1900s um, pen and ink illustrations um, for like, uh, like Oscar Wilde Salome illustrations are incredible. Um, or even, you know, 1920s wine advertisements from Alphonse Mucha. I'm very big into the, the look of art and advertisements from that era. And I think it kind of, has run into the work that I do. I don't think I necessarily have a very like modern inking style. Um, if I'm given the chance, I love to do really old school kind of just hatching techniques that you would see in 18th century uh, magazine illustrations. Like there's an artist, Jeremy Bastian. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with his work. But he, um, he's a comic book artist, but he's taken his love of sort of that same era. And he uses nothing but like, I think it's a crow quill pen, very, very tiny um, nib. And he does incredibly fine detailed uh, renderings. And so it's not so much about, you know, him meeting quick deadlines and turnaround. It's more about him being able to use that art style to tell his stories. So the one thing I really wanted to do with her hair is give her kind of like a cool, like almost 1920s, like I'm talking about, um, play with the shapes of her hair. And I, I just really, like I said, her costume is really cool. She's got a lot of texture. She's got kind of like a bone choker and then a diamond pattern too. So I just do stuff real loose um, just to get the feel and, you know, where I want things in the space. And then I can go and kind of get it a little more finalized towards the end here. Somebody asked if I could show the side by side of the original sketch and the final piece. Yes, I sure can. Um, so for this piece here, this is the sketch that I did. Um, and obviously you can see it's sort of on a more vertical format. So it's a very, very loose sketch. It gives me an idea of where her hand placement is, her facial features, and just the, the pose and the energy of what's going on. Um, and then the pose for the echo piece is once again, very loose, very scribbly, but it allows me to get the movement of the character. So I know that that's gonna be what I need to translate. In this piece, I kind of moved her arm a little bit up to fit a more horizontal perspective. In this piece, they were kind of wrapped around her body a little bit more. Somebody's asking how I develop my style. The facial features are so strong and distinct. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I watched a lot of anime as a kid. And um, a lot of like overseas animation was always, you know, really interesting to me. So for a while, you know, I, I taught myself how to do sort of uh, anime style eyes, kind of an Eastern cartoony uh, drawing style. 
And I always love the work of Masumi Shiro, who did Ghost in the Shell, the original manga. And, um, you know, he's got a ton of other projects under his belt. But I had a lot of his graphic novels growing up. And it's it's a very, like, high contrast between extremely cartoony and very well-informed and very technical um, technology. So you have these incredibly rendered robots and everything on the robots been super well thought out and planned to where if you had to actually build that thing, it probably would work. Um, but, you know, just, just playing with all these different ways to draw faces too was really interesting to me. Um, they oftentimes will minimize facial features into sort of a cartoony way. And then they also have the ability to showcase different emotions through playing with that. And of course, I, you know, I, I also have studied uh, artists like uh, Michael Kaluta, and um, a lot of the kind of the 1970s European artists were huge influences for me. I didn't read a lot of comics growing up because I didn't actually know where you could buy them. So. Um, what I used to do is go to an antique mall, which unfortunately is now closed. And he used to sell comic books, but he also had this section that he stocked one day with all these old heavy metal magazines. And that, as a teenager, blew my mind. The, the level of intricacy in the artwork and just how like crazy some of the designs and the storytelling were. And then also the variation in art styles. A lot of it was traditionally their marker rendered or hand painted or ink washes. Not a lot of digital work because these were all, you know, from the 70s and I think early 80s. But it introduced me to a lot of, um, I don't know if they would be considered sort of well-known artists. They're kind of more underground fantasy-based artists. So Barry Windsor Smith, um, I think it's, uh, I'm blanking on a name right now. Um, John Gerard, I mean, obviously, is a huge influence to Mobius. I love the the way that he can do faces. Um, in high school, I bought his Blueberry series before it had been translated. So I didn't speak French. I had all these <laughs> art books in French. But I bought them for the artwork, not necessarily for the storyline. So he's a huge influence. Actually, uh, Hayao Miyazaki, too. His Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, if you ever get a chance to purchase that or read it in graphic novel format. I, I'm not so much a fan of the animated feature because I feel like they had to shorten too much of the story in order to fit it into a feature-length film. But the manga is so dense and beautiful. It's one of my favorites. So all, all these different influences, I mean, that, Art Nouveau, heavy metal artists, um, turn of the century illustration, I think they all kind of informed the way I've chosen to draw characters, faces, and expressions. And then somehow it kind of boils down and becomes your style after so many years of doing it. YouTube, do you have any tips for inking with a shaky hand? <laughs> hmm. Not really. I actually do, I don't know if you can see it, I do have a little bit of a shaky hand. Um, and I, I'm not super steady, so if you, if you could pour over my work and get up close to it, it's not as smooth as it looks. One kind of trick that I've utilized over the years is... Um, actually drawing quite a bit larger than the actual printed page. So 11 by 17 is like the smallest that I work now. Obviously, these are very small. These are just for the camera. Um, but oftentimes, I've found that working on even larger, so like 16 by 20, it allows me to not get so up, uptight with my line work. But it also, when shrunken down, looks like a very technical drawing, and you can't see any maybe inconsistencies in the line or shaky lines. So I think that actually does help, this kind of masks any like shaky lines you might get in the size that you work. 
it gives your hand a break too. When you're working big, you can do like full arm things. So it's, it's not so much of this focusing on one little square inch area, which can also kind of intensify if you have injuries or um, you get sort of tight shoulders or tight muscles when you draw. So working larger has helped me too with that. So as you can see, I'm just super roughly blocking in. This will be the side of her hand. There'll be a joint. She kind of does like a finger pose. They make it kind of rock and roll. Um, thumb. I kind of like a little bit over-exaggerated arm lengths and stuff. I think it makes it more dramatic. So proportionately, this is, you know, not necessarily your standard, like, proportion. And I'm fine with that. I'm deliberately pushing proportions for the sake of the art piece. And that might actually be kind of cool to like make her hair go behind her hands. So she's got kind of like this gnarly 80s motorcycle jacket that's like cropped and very like, like shoulder patty. Somebody's asking on Twitch, Space Dave 333, what kind of pencil is that? This is a, well this one, I've used it so much that it's worn off the logo. <laughs> have a couple of them. Um, they're Koh-i-Noor hard, hard Muth. Um, one's an 07, the other one's, the brown ones here are 05 leads. So I usually keep both just to have on hand. Sometimes the, the thicker um, line is needed. They have little retractable like erasers on the end here. I remember they were kind of expensive. I think it was like a reward for doing some projects and big projects. I'm, like, I'm going to buy myself a nice mechanical pencil. And I tried out several other ones. I used to use one of those electric erasers too, but I find it's just kind of a pain in the butt when you're switching back and forth between holding a pencil and holding an eraser. This I can quickly flip around, erase, flip back. And if I use all the eraser, they have refills that you can pop in. So this, I think I will probably end just with her belt at the very bottom here, because I'm kind of cropping the, the artwork a little bit. And I'll use that belt design because it's pretty rad as sort of a design element here at the bottom. Her whole outfit's just super cool. It'd be a really cool cosplay outfit. It's just like super chunky layers and lots of different patterns. Almost like a rattlesnake design going down the front here. See, initially I did these triangles too big, so I'm making them a little bit smaller. A question from YouTube. Do you have any advice on how to get discovered as an artist in 2020? Um, don't make getting discovered your reason for doing it. <laughs> I would say just keep drawing every day. If you have an Instagram, keep posting every day um, the work that you're doing. So editors or people seeking out new artists can see um, not only your work ethic, but also any sort of like progress that you might make as an artist. Um, I think that's really important. And I've, I've asked editors and stuff, you know, how did you find my work and what was it about my work that, um, you know, stood out to you? And a lot of them, would mention the range that I have because I can do comic book work, but I can also do a more photorealistic illustration. So being able to not be stuck with one style or focus on, you know, creating a style for people to recognize you by. I think if you show people that you can do a variety of different things, it shows maybe a strength as an artist. Honestly, like I, I try to 
pick projects that I love. I'm not that concerned with, you know, editors seeking me out for whatever. Um, I'm happy to have work and I'm happy that people approach me for work, but I'm also pretty selective of the work that I choose to do. And sometimes the work that I do is better suited to either like a academic setting or a more independent setting too. When I first started out, you know, I was, it was before social media and all this stuff. So the only way you could have an editor from a major comic book company review your work was to go to San Diego Comic Con and sit in the line for the portfolio review once a year or to risk sending it via snail mail, <laughs> these giant 11 by 17 photocopies of your work and hope that somehow it managed to get on the desk of an editor to even look at and didn't end up in the trash. So I think, you know, any aspiring artist now have it so much easier because it's so easy to like tag an editor in a post on Twitter, or on social media. Um, and it's also so easy for editors to browse tons and tons of artists. I think the one maybe downside to that is that there's so many talented people that they have to sort through now. Um, and the competition is probably higher than it's ever been because there's kids that are like, you know, they're not very old, they're like 15 and they're, they can draw so incredibly well. And they know digital programs too. That's another thing. They have like such an ease with these digital programs and the technology that's available now. Whereas when I was growing up, Photoshop was like the big thing you had to learn. And most people, unless you were working in the industry, they didn't have Photoshop because it was a very expensive program. So perhaps that's dating me, but... um. A question from Angel Goated 25 How long does it usually take to draw with details, or does it depend on the drawing? Um, it kind of depends. Like, I sometimes I'll, oops, I will get very into doing the details and doing, um, you know, very heavily rendered pencils. Oftentimes, um, I don't have the luxury of doing that because the deadlines are so quick. So I've just sort of developed like a, a very loose style that I, can read enough so when I get to the inking process, I know exactly what I need to do. Um, and like maybe it, that that's not necessarily something that works for all artists. I know many people that need to have very finished pencils before they feel comfortable even hitting it with an ink pen. Oh, and I know some pencilers that can't ink their own stuff too, so they ask. You know, they've got to have a level of completeness to their pencils in order to hand it off to somebody else. Or they have a very, you know, good relationship with an inker that's familiar enough with their work over the years that they can take their chicken scratches and kind of read them. Um, So, I mean, I can spend anywhere from like half an hour on pencils. If I'm doing a full like 16 by 20 inch, super, super rendered pencil thing, and maybe sometimes I'll just do pencils and I'll scan the pencils in for a project. So I need to have really finished pencils. Sometimes that can take me like a full day. Sometimes if I allow myself the time, I can even spend two days on something like that. Somebody from Facebook, your focus is on femme Native American characters right now. But what male characters do you want to draw as well? Um, that's a good question. I've just sort of drawn more female characters because there is such a lack of representation. Batman's got a really rad costume, and I think he would be really fun to draw. Um, I've always been a fan of like Wolverine. Um, I like his backstory. I like that he's sort of an imperfect character. I also like the texture on <laughs> you have like the stubble texture. I'm a big texture nut, so I like I like characters with texture. I'm not very good at doing super clean, streamlined type of characters. Um, I always joked about doing like a Native American Captain America. I think that would be kind of cool. I think it might have been done actually. And there's this really cool cosplay um, that 
a guy on Instagram did kind of a native Captain America, but I think that would be a real cool way to like sort of rewrite that history, give it a different perspective. I, I kind of like the weird, obscure characters, too, like ones that are really, like, theatrical or dramatic. Like Spider-Man, you can draw really kind of theatrical posing and really just off-the-wall poses. Doctor Strange is kind of cool because he's got kind of weird, funky poses. Um, the Silver Surfer has always been interesting to me, too. My dad actually used to surf with Jack Kirby's daughter when we first moved down here um, before he passed away. And I had no clue who Jack Kirby was as a kid. I was just like, wow, your dad draws comics. That's neat. And then later on, I find out, you know, when I'm a teenager, I get kind of more familiar with his standing in comics. And I'm like, oh, man, that's incredible. Um, but I think story is big for me. If there's not like a solid story behind a character, then I'm not that interested in the character. I think the characters with really solid stories behind them are really maybe difficult or like, you know, emotionally demanding um, plot lines. That's kind of what interests me too. keep switching pencils because my eraser actually ran out on this one and I think okay I actually had different leads in these earlier one was a softer lead and one was a harder lead but I think they're actually the same Somebody from Facebook, uh, Hope, she says, are you Native American as well? Yes, I'm actually Scottish and I'm um, Tongva from Los Angeles um, Basin. So our tribal lands extend from about Malibu all the way down to roughly Long Beach, um, downtown LA, Hollywood, Pasadena, it's all Tongva land. I'm sure if you've been following any of the land acknowledgements or any of the work that's been going on in the last couple of years with um, recognizing original people on their homelands, you've probably heard the word Tongva be used. When I was growing up, it was almost unknown. Um, if anybody referred to our tribe, they called them Gabrielino, which was actually a Spanish term for them. Um, the word Tongva is something that we've coined in order to reintroduce a name for the survivors of our tribe in our own language. Traditionally, we would all have come from separate village sites. So there is somewhere between 250 to 500 separate villages. Um, and each village was named individually and then would have sort of a specific dialect spoken from that particular village. So there is a huge amount of language variation in our tribe. But with colonization and with the genocide and everything else, um, all of that kind of started getting erased and lost and so in this century we've sort of rebranded and reclaimed you know who we are as survivors of all of that some people refer to themselves as gabrielino tongva some people simply tongva some people prefer the usage of the term gabrielino but we are all from the same area so it's just a personal perspective on it. I'm really digging her hoop earrings on this. It's kind of a cool little thing. Somebody from Twitch is asking what it's like working for Marvel. It's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really stoked to be able to 
you know, especially be drawing female Native American characters from their their archives. Um, you know, I think with the, the changes politically and everything, that they see that there's a demand for these sorts of things. I've been part of um, some groups, you know, for the last five, seven years that have really been pushing for indigenous representation in mainstream work. So whether that be seen as pop culture, whether it be in comic books, film, other media, um, we've been pushing for it for many, many years, and it's really cool to see... Um, you know, companies like Marvel pick up on that and then also be supportive in hiring not only Native artists, but Native writers. Hopefully it eventually bleeds into Native editorial staff, et cetera, et cetera, up the line. So I'm almost finished with the pencils. I'm going a little bit more detailed with these pencils only because I haven't drawn this character that much. In fact, this is actually the first time I've drawn this character. So in it not being that familiar, I'm allowing myself more detail than I normally go to make sure I have things correct. She's got a really cool jacket. So she's got kind of like this furry thing on one shoulder and I'm not quite sure if I want to include that or leave it out. Because it's a in the way of her hair flow a little bit. That's kind of like I, things that you, you know, can make executive decisions on as an artist. Like, oh, is that going to affect the way that you're going to be able to see her hair in this shot? Maybe you don't want to throw it in there as much or, but I think it works. So I'll just do some like hair over it. I can't wait to see somebody cosplay this. She's got kind of zigzags along the cuff here. So I think a big part of comic book art too is understanding costuming and um, knowing how fabric and materials drape over the body. That's a huge thing. It always kind of bugs me with some artists or they don't understand maybe how things drape or how the body would interact with fabric and it just looks like you know the character is basically naked like super skin tight spandex because even with the best cosplay costumes like honestly you're still going to have wrinkles here and there you're going to have an interaction between the the fabric and the the body and you need to be aware of how that's going to work in space and with mass underneath it and is it going to volume out, you know? So a lot of the time when I'm doing costuming, especially new characters like this, I'm thinking like, if this was a real outfit, what would it be made out of? I'm guessing her jacket would probably be like super heavy, like biker leather. So um, it's, it's going to be stiff. And it's not going to bend as easily as if it were a thinner material. So it's going to create... Um, kind of a shell over her body. It's not gonna be skin tight because you need the leather to be quite a bit bigger than the body in order to move comfortably. But yeah, so that's where life drawing comes in. If you can sign up for a life drawing class, it's great. Because a lot of the time they'll throw drapery and costuming in there too and it gives you just exercises and drawing different materials and how they interact with the body, which then builds up a better mental encyclopedia for, you know, future work on how, how things should lay. All right, I think that's good. I'm gonna go to inks now. Let me reline this up for you guys to see. And I'll, I'll send it a little bit closer to you so you can kind of get an idea of how um, how detailed my pencils get. And they can get more detailed than this. This is still pretty sketchy for me, but um, 
you know, it gives me lines to work off of and ideas of costuming and everything else. Let me answer a couple more questions off the questions too. Let's see here. Somebody from YouTube, do you erase much while sketching? Obviously I do. <laughs> um, I'm constantly using the little eraser on there and there's nothing wrong with erasing stuff at all. It's just, it's you working through your thoughts. So. Somebody on Twitch is asking, would you ever consider drawing Warpath? I would be interested to see your version. Yeah, maybe. I mean, if I had a reason to do it, maybe for like a cool pinup or something, I'd be interested in doing it. Um, Super Skeety from Twitch. I'm pretty bad at drawing hands. Got any tips for drawing them? Uh, draw more of them. There's actually a really good book. I think it's called 200 Hands or something. And it's specifically only um, pictures of hands. It gives you all these different poses and perspectives and foreshortening, and it breaks down all the finger bones and hands. Um, so I think it's practice and becoming familiar with the different parts of the hand. And then they become very easy. And when you don't just think of them as an appendage, you think of them as a way to transfer whatever movement your character is experiencing. I mean, a lot of superhero poses are very dram dramatic and dynamic. And a, a lot of the way that that's shown is through the fingers and the hands. So if you think of the way that hands are used in dance and theater um, as a expression or a translation of whatever emotions they're feeling, um, I think that translates into comic book art tremendously. So watch ballet, watch dance on YouTube and see how they're not using words to explain something, but they're using their hands to do it. Mime work, silent film, theater. And you realize it's a storytelling device and it's not necessarily just an appendage that you're, you know, having trouble drawing. As I'm inking this, I'm thinking, dang, I should have pushed it into like the Art Nouveau kind of segment even more because she has this cool hand and it kind of just fits that that art style. So maybe I'll draw this character again because she's pretty neat. I got really excited when I saw the variant cover and then even more excited when I looked her up and I saw her character design. <laughs> So if you have any more questions for me, please um, drop them in the comments section on Instagram if you're watching, um, or excuse me, um, you'll be watching this on YouTube or Twitch, I think, wherever you're watching it from. Normally, I would be a little bit closer to my work, too, to be doing really fine line inking. But because the webcam is kind of in the way, I'm having to ink at a distance. Then I'm going to try to talk a little bit less and then just go at my normal inking speed so you can kind of get an idea about the pace that I work and also because we're running towards the end of this I hope you enjoyed it I'm really stoked to have been invited to draw for you guys live I've done these on my Instagram page and stuff um, and normally when I'm at conventions I'll draw at conventions but obviously with the COVID stuff going on this year I haven't been able to do much of that
also when you're inking don't be scared to like like overlap your lines or you know mess up or get ink where you maybe didn't want it to be um you can always go back in with white ink and do cleanup work um or pop certain areas i know some and especially when i first started inking i always thought my inks had to be perfect and whatever line i laid down that was like it there was no going back um it's kind of like a fatalist way to like ink <laughs> and when i started working for you know howard shaken he he taught me so much about just the how you go about cleaning up um ink work and how you go about to starting with really loose lines and kind of finessing them as you get closer to a finished piece and it kind of changed my my whole perspective on what's okay to do um, and that it's okay to have messy inks because there's so many methods and supplies that you can use to touch them up. I know some people that will drop them into Photoshop and they clean them up that way too. Hopefully you can see the variation that I'm able to get with these brush pens. I mean, I can get a pretty heavy, solid weighted line, and I can get pretty fine lines. I think there's actually ways to hack them too. I, got, I managed to like fill an empty cartridge with like other ink. Um, and get colored ink going through here, which was kind of fun. The ink flow wasn't perfect, but it worked. And I'm deliberately kind of avoiding doing her hair right now because I know once I do the hair, it's going to be wet and I'm not going to be able to necessarily go over it quickly. So I'm going to try to get her hands and her sleeves and then work back to the rest of the body because then I know that's out of the way and I'm not going to smear it. Let me check for some more questions on here too. You guys are solid. You've kept me like entertained answering these, the whole thing. So um, let's see. From Twitch, did you ever meet B. Stanley? You know, I saw him at San Diego Comic Con, but I never like stood in line um, to like meet him because a lot of the time I was at a booth um, or I was waiting in line, you know, somewhere else. There's only so many lines you can wait in. So no, I ac never actually got the opportunity to meet him in person. Although I do know many people that were diehard and they waited in line for many, many hours <laughs> to meet him. <laughs> Another question from Twitch, how important is the writer when you are choosing your next project? I would say the writer is incredibly important. Um, like I said, I'm fairly picky with the work that I do. And most of the time um, I, I ask to read a finished manuscript prior to agreeing to working on anything. In this case, um, it was a little bit of a quicker deadline. I actually didn't know who my writer was until um, I had already signed on to the project. Um, so there are cases where you kind of just have to roll with it. Most of the time though, because I'm, I work on a lot of, you know, either historically based or fact-based projects or culturally sensitive projects, I, I um, try to be very mindful and um, I, I review manuscripts almost as a precursor to involvement with anything. I recently signed on to a historical book. I'm doing book illustrations for it. And um, the author had some pretty impressive history and publication, but I told him, 
I really need to read like the full manuscript before I can agree to this because it was dealing with a lot of California native issues. Um, and he was, he was very kind and generous and he, um, he sent the manuscript over to me and it was actually while I was in the middle of finishing echo pages and then also finishing up another project. So I discovered the, the online like PDF readers, which are wonderful. And I actually spent three days listening to a PDF reader robot, um, read the manuscript for me so I could work, but then listen to the material and then make sure that it was something that I was okay with, you know, saying yes to. And in the cases where I don't get to read things beforehand and any issues do come up with sensitivity, I, I try to maintain very open dialogue with either the editor that I'm working with or the writer and let them know if there's something that I find problematic and see if there's a way that we could work it out um, to either go through a rewrite or just have a discussion. I think with the work that I do, because I do oftentimes work on indigenous focused projects, um, there's a greater sense of responsibility that I have in reviewing materials before signing on to them. And that's a personal decision. That's nothing that anybody's ever asked me to do. It's me feeling comfortable with the project and my name on the project. So one area on this I'm really not sure about is her hand gestures. And I've seen it in, you know, some of the reference material. And um, I need to figure out if they're meaningful hand gestures. So there's one hand. And my little trick for not smearing things too badly. It's a great trick. It's super cheap too. Scrap paper. And I'm assuming these are eagle feathers in her hair. And she looks like she's got maybe a woodpecker feather or something in there too. Know your feathers though, guys. Somebody is asking about reference material. I have like bird botany books where it gives you all the different types of species of birds <laughs> and I've actually like learned how to draw specific feathers for specific species because an owl feather is not made the same as an eagle feather which in turn is not the same as say like a raven or a crow or whatever else they all have different purposes and different um, construction and everything else So if you have that weird job and they ask you to draw like a specific type of bird or animal, just know that you can add that to your mental like encyclopedia later on. That if somebody has like an obscure request, you can be like, well, I know how to draw, you know, the claws of a wolverine or something. Not necessarily the character, but the animal. actually really surprised how quickly this went I was I was a little nervous I won't lie when I first started doing this and I've drawn like you know at conventions in public and normally it doesn't bother me but the minute they announced this last night like on the social media I freaked out a little bit and like I have a lecture tomorrow and I'm honestly not as nervous about that lecture as I was about drawing this today so thank you all for watching and also for your great questions because it really does help me. Um, 
it allows me to talk about something I'm comfortable talking about while I'm drawing it. And um, it helps me kind of see what you guys are interested in. And if there's any aspiring artists out there, I hope that like I answered your questions. And if I didn't, please ask them in the chat and I'd be more than happy to. Um, you're also welcome to comment on any of my stuff on social media. I try to engage with my audience quite a bit. Um, and if you post comments on my artwork and stuff online, I do, you know, make an honest concerted effort to either try to reply directly to that or, you know, help in any way that I can. And I think the inside of this jacket has like a cool lacing thing up the sleeve. So I'm going to add like a little bit of a lace design. It's so 80s. It's really 80s. And I'm sure you can see too, a lot of the time I'll do sort of the outlines of things first and then I go in and add the details later. Because once you have the, the basic shape down, um, it kind of allows you to then micromanage it into smaller details and stuff. I think the ink is actually drawing better than I am expecting it to. But I just, I really don't want to smear this, so. Sorry, I'm covering it up a bit. So all the things in this particular piece, you know, it, her fringe, her hair, the feathers, um, they're helping to create a sense of movement around the character. Um, and I think that's another important thing to kind of pay attention is like, okay, maybe they have, you know, superpowers, but how are those superpowers allowing them to interact with the environment around them? Like Storm is a great example on how kind of the air and the atmosphere around her when she's using her powers, changes. And if you think about that with any of the characters and how whatever environment they're currently in, how it might change or fluctuate based on the character's powers, I think it helps to support, um, you know, a drawing that you're doing of the character. I know I'm getting close to finishing time on here. I might go over maybe five minutes, but maybe I'll be um, okay. I've got another comment from Twitch from Bat Knight 200. I really love how you did those cuffs and sleeves. They look amazing. How much do you work with the colorists who color your work? Um, to be quite honest, I actually color my own work a lot of the time. For this Marvel gig, they offered up colorists, and it was really the first time that I've ever been asked to hand select a colorist or to comment on what my thoughts were um, about them coloring my artwork. That was something that I've, I've never really, you know, had a conversation about. Um, I've purposely taught myself digital coloring and also traditional coloring. So I have more of the ability to kind of be like a triple threat. When I first started in comics, most people did one thing. They either penciled, they inked, they lettered, or they colored. Occasionally you'd meet a penciler who inked their own work, but it wasn't common. But I feel like nowadays it's way more common. Um, and, and that partially has to do with the technology too. It's much easier for people to scan in their work and just do more of the finish on their own. Um, let's 
so yeah like I I generally color my own work a lot of the stuff you see on Instagram I've done on my own um and I, I actually like doing colors I like doing traditional painted colors and I really love doing marker renders um some of my favorite artists like Jean Girard um they were great technical um colorists like they did a lot of film work and character designs and uh, I have a fifth element art book that they did a bunch of well John Gerard did character designs for and uh you know set design and whatnot but the the rendered marker illustrations I love and they used to use the old-fashioned like alcohol pens that um I guess interior designers and stuff would use technical pens. People use Copic pens now. Um, I prefer Prismacolors to Copics, but I know that the Copics have a tendency not to be color fast over the years. The really old markers were like heavy alcohol base and, you know, light sensitive and stuff, but. So now I can do that with like wash paint. Um, occasionally I still use Prismacolors, mainly for like sketches and stuff if I'm doing it at conventions, just because they're easy to transport. But um, I've kind of moved into using paints and toned inks because I think that they're more permanent. And um, there's an artist I follow and she actually has done a lot of like uh, experimenting with the color fastness of Copic markers. and um other supplies and you know she made a really good point that people you know if they purchase like a sketch from you at a convention it's important that you you try your best to use good quality supplies for that so you know if they frame it in their house that it doesn't fade over the years and that they have something that they can you know invest in and that the supplies that were used to do it last as long as the art does I have a question from Jace, a disgrace. This might be a question that's a bit too difficult to answer on the spot, but as a Native woman, do you think the tendency of comics to tie Native characters directly into Indigenous mysticism to be a cliche and restrictive, or do you always think it's an acceptable, it's acceptable as a way to introduce audiences? to Native American cultures and people since they're not as widely represented? Um, that's a really good question, actually. And I do, I, I do consider it slightly problematic. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that books like this are trying to take problematic characters and, you know, if they can, through a writer and an artist, write maybe wrongs or stereotypes that they had in pre-existing um, you know, manifestations or printings, I think that's one way to fix the problem. I think another way is to provide characters that are relevant in today's time. Um, so many of these characters have like backstories that were done in the past or through a historical lens. And I think that's problematic because it sets us back into something that is of the past and that we're not here now currently in the present day. So when I see um, modern either figures in pop culture or characters in comics um, representing indigenous people today, I think that's incredibly powerful. And I think that's what kids really need to see because I didn't have that growing up. I never had a native character that wasn't set in the past or that didn't have mystical animal powers or, you know, all these stereotypes that people throw at us as native people. And I think it's harmful too, because it basically takes away our freedom of religion and of identifying ourselves and our oral histories. And it, it lumps them all together into this like pseudo new agey um, stereotype, which is something that we, you know, we've fought against it for so many years and we still fight against it today with like the mainstream use and sale of white sage. That's one huge way. Um, 
that's a medicine plant that um, grew on the West Coast predominantly and yet has been adopted along with the abalone shell across so many tribes in the U.S. And yes, you know, native tribes did trade um, in the past, but many tribes also had their own medicines that they would use, and it wasn't necessarily sage in an abalone shell. So then you get into sort of pan-Indian um, representations and lots of different areas. So I think, you know, with the work that I do, I try to be aware of those things. Um, I try to maybe fight against them or figure out more creative ways to deal with that in my own work if I'm able to. But I also take into the consideration that, you know, we're still living our lives through a very recent um, genocide and also through a colonial lens. So sometimes, you know, different people are at different levels of decolonization, if you want to use that term. Um, and they're, you know, they're coming out of this genocide and rediscovering maybe who they were or rediscovering some oral history in their families. So you can't necessarily fault them personally for using things like that or perhaps misusing because what they're ultimately trying to do is heal from something very painful and get in touch with either past family members or, you know, their, their tribe and their family and their ancestors in ways that they feel that they can or that are openly available to them. And that varies for every single person. I mean, I'm not 100% Native American. Um, I have Spanish ancestry. I have Scottish ancestry. I also have other tribes besides Tongva um, mixed into my lineage. And because I weren't, I wasn't raised in those, um, you know, circles. I don't claim them because I don't feel like I have the responsibility to claim those things. Perhaps later in life, when I've you know, invest the time into seeking out those areas, I can then say with confidence um, that they're part of me and that I'm doing everything in my way to be respectful of those ancestors. But at this current, you know, time, I'm, I'm learning about, you know, other tribes and languages that are part of who I am. And sometimes that takes longer too. I mean, it, it's a learning thing for anybody rediscovering any sort of native heritage, and you have to go at your own pace. So I'm just going to finish this up real quick. Um, ink in her final designs here, and then also finish the front, and then we'll be fun. And I didn't get to doing gray tones on this, but I think maybe what I'll do is I'll scan these inks, and then... Maybe I will do some color washes or some um, ink washes on these, and then I'll post those on my Instagram page when they're finished. Because I think especially this piece, I mean, the colors in her costuming are just really bold and bright, and I think it would be some fun punches of color to do. So like I was saying earlier too, depending on how you kind of put this pen to paper, you can really get a, a huge variety of um, textures and line weights, very much like a brush, but without the messy cleanup. They're nice for me because I have small, I have two young children, one four and one seven, and they love to be around me when I'm doing my pages. So if I have to like get up all of a sudden, because somebody spilled some food or, you know, attend somebody's needs, then I can just put the cap on really quickly. And then I don't have to worry about it drying out. I don't have to worry about ruining my brushes because I didn't rinse them out right away.
Let me just put some lines here of her blouse in and then ink her belt and then the other design on the other side and we're all done. And I just want to thank everybody for the great questions once again and also for, you know, tuning in. This is one of my first live streams. I've done them on Instagram and stuff, but um, I've, I don't think I've done any like real official ones. So this feels pretty official. Um, And I hope you guys all pre-ordered Indigenous Voices number one at your favorite comic book shop. There's some really cool variant covers and I hope you guys are excited about it coming out. I just imagine these like crazy motorcycle lacings. I think I'll definitely be drawing this character again. I think she's got some potential for some really cool pinup work. Just with the designs alone, all these triangles and circles. All right, I'm almost done there. And there you go. Straighten it out just a bit. And I just want to thank you guys all for watching. So thank you so much. Hope you guys follow me on Instagram, Twitter, wherever else, and I hope you guys really enjoy the work that I did for Marvel Indigenous Voices number one. Thanks again. What kind of music do you play at a party and everybody's there to see you off? What kind of music